The following is a special video presentation of the Hennepin County Library. Hi, welcome to a discussion with David Walachinsky. I'm Dave Carlson of Hennepin County Library. And our guest today is the co-author or author of more than 17 books, including The People's Almanac, published in 1975, and The Book of List, published in 1977. And David is here to talk about his new book, The Book of List for the 90s edition, just published in 1993. Uh, the People's Almanac was a successful bestseller and still a, uh, a stalwart of library shelves and people's uh, collections. Uh, the Book of List came out two years later, mm -hmm. originally, and that was kind of a spin-off of The People's Almanac, but I'll start off by asking you to maybe explain a little bit about The People's Almanac and how it spun off in The Book of List and give me a list of the reasons uh, why you uh, came up with the, the idea for the book. I, I was, uh, my, f my father, uh, Irving Wallace, had raised me on reference books. I, I was one of those kids who used to read the World Book for Pleasure. <laughs> and uh, just devour books of statistics. And uh, I f became disillusioned in the 60s and uh, early 70s with the, the state of almanacs and reference books. I felt that they weren't getting behind the scenes and telling the true stories. They were just giving out government press releases on what was happening in different countries and so forth. And I also thought they were very dry. And uh, so uh, I came up with the idea of a people's almanac which would get a little bit more behind the scenes and also be more fun to read. And so this was The People's Almanac. Uh, it, as you said, it was published in 1975. It had a small first printing and then took off and sold a million copies, much to our delight and surprise. One of the chapters was uh, lists, which was everything from the highest mountains and largest uh, lakes to more unusual things, uh, such as uh, historical events that happened in the bathtub. And this <laughs> was uh, fun to put together, and people really liked that chapter. So we uh, uh, compiled an entire book of lists in 1977, and that was number one bestseller also. And eventually we did three uh, People's Almanacs, three book of lists. And then we got exhausted. We had set ourselves the task of making each one completely different. They weren't just updates. And so we took a, a rest from it. So this book of lists, which I did with my sister, Amy Wallace, is the first book of lists in, in 10 years. And there, for those people who are old People's Almanac fans, in 1995, there will be a People's Almanac of the 20th century. That's interesting. Look forward to that. Um, the Book of List, when it first came out in 1977, uh, it either seemed to start a trend or was the part of a kind of a trend toward interest in trivia, uh, development of the Trivial Pursuit game. Uh, it's even come down to David Letterman's top ten list, which yeah. is so popular. Yeah. Uh, but I know that you differentiate a little bit between just uh, the, the trivia movement and what you call significa. Right. I, I'm not good at trivia. I can't tell you who played which part on Gilligan's Island or something like that. Uh, but what we call significa is unusual information about more significant topics. Now, some of what we put in the book of lists is just funny, and, and particularly in this edition, we really. 1993 edition, we've really tried to make it as funny as possible. But uh, what has now become known as trivia is really uh, a more narrow subject, and, and that's not what we deal with. Mm -hmm. and in fact, the, the word significa, which we, which we use, uh, was given to us by Gary Owens, the, uh, the, uh, the radio, radio disc jockey. On, that's on him, yeah. yeah. And he uh -huh. was the one who said to us, you know, this isn't trivia. I don't like it when they call your work trivia. And so he gave us the word significa. Huh. Um, who uses your book? Who, who do you find is your, your clientele, so to speak, and, uh, and how is it used? Um, I can only judge by the letters we get from readers. We, we ask for people to write and give us feedback mm -hmm. and new lists and so forth. There seems to be a whole range. The uh, youngest uh, reader I've ever received a letter from was nine, and the oldest was uh, 91. So I think we, we covered, um, and uh, it, with the list and almanac is a little bit different, the, the audience we get. The People's Almanac has more writing in it and more actual reading, so we get more 
uh, people who really love to sit down and read and learn learn information and, and the uh, the list is more fun uh, so we, we we had this always had this motto which was with the people's almanac you should enjoy yourself while you're learning something and with the book of lists it was you should learn something while you're enjoying yourself and I think <laughs> that's that's the difference uh -huh. Um, what are some of the interesting responses you've gotten from uh, the people writing in about Book of Lists? Man, I, I, Where do you I, begin? I, 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 it's, it's hard, to, uh, hard to tell you. I, I once got a letter uh, from somebody uh, saying that he was D.B. Cooper, and I'm the one who's the real D.B. Cooper, the guy who, you know, the so first hijacker dropped the airplane, the airplane yeah. and all that. And he said, if you want me to contact you, put an ad in this paper on this day, and then I will contact you. And unfortunately, I had been out of town, and, and when I opened my fan mail, the date had passed, and we'll <laughs> never know if he was really B.B. Cooper. Uh, and uh, oh, I, I just, I get, we, we used to get a lot of letters, particularly for the People's Almanac, since there's so much readable material. A lot of letters from prisoners who have lots of time on their hand mm -hmm. and want to better. Every, every fact in there. Yeah, and they want to better themselves. Uh -huh. They want to learn something. And so uh, we always got a lot of mail from them. Do they, uh, are they quick to point out any errors or any inaccuracies that at least they think they find? It's harder for prisoners because they don't have access to a library to check what they think is wrong. Mm -hmm. We've gotten letters from other people uh, either finding uh, errors or challenging thinking they found an error, <laughs> but in fact they're not uh -huh. right. You know. So you have a pretty good success ratio. Uh, yeah, we have a very good success uh -huh. ratio. Um, society's changed a lot since uh, the book here in 1993 compared to when it came out in 1977, uh, the book of lists in particular. Um, what, uh, of the, in, society, in, the, in those terms, as society has changed, how has your, how's your book changed? Uh, for one thing, people are reading less. And I find, we found in my sister and I in preparing this volume, that it was a challenge to try to come up with lists and a style of writing that would draw in people that have stopped reading, particularly young people, which seems to be, a, I, I've seen the statistics, and you know, most households in the United States don't buy a book in an average year. So this was a little more challenging. For example, in the book of list three, which came out in 1983, we had concentrated a lot on what we call annotated lists, where, where not just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, but where each each entry in the list has a little story. Mm -hmm. And uh, although we have a lot of lists like that in the new book of lists, we found it uh, better to make those annotations shorter, just to to make sure that we can draw in more people. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's one of the differences. Like a thirty-second sound bites. Now well, it, it's like it's a, being condensed. I mean, you're you're no longer just competing with uh, with television. You're competing with two-minute music videos. Mm -hmm. As I uh, look back on some of the original book of list and the new one, uh, I did notice some interesting changes. Uh, for instance, where in uh, the book of list two you listed the most dangerous sites to be in a nuclear attack. Now you list the most dangerous places to be in terms of crime. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Well, thank goodness that change has happened. Uh, you know, maybe uh, uh, maybe the next volume we won't even have to have that section. Uh -huh. But uh, uh, no, I, I, I hope that uh, if we can uh, put a damper on the Chinese, that we won't have to worry about nuclear weapons for a while. <laughs> we'll talk a little bit about format, uh, but uh, kind of tying in with the changes. Um, I had noticed, uh, I compared a list from the book of list number two uh, about least segregated and most mm -hmm. segregated cities mm -hmm. and compared it with the new list that was uh, provided in 1993. They mm -hmm. were, uh, apparently the information was gathered from different studies, but there were no cities at all that were in the original list that are in the new list. Both lists, even though they came from different sources, these are academic sources, were, were based on the same statistical premise, which was what they call dissimilarity ratio. How many people, white or black, would have to move in order to create uh, neighborhoods that exactly represented the population of the city as a whole? So they would both use the same basis. I think what you see with, with the most segregated cities is that uh, the cities who are on the top of such a list uh, 15 years ago, uh, 10 years ago, made, a, made an attempt to make changes. Mm -hmm. And the other ones, Gary, Indiana, didn't make an attempt to make any changes. Uh, 
with the least segregated cities, what what happened was in in, in the, the original list in 1980, it was more the more liberal, tolerant towns. Then what happened was the military integrated a lot. And if you look at the current list of the least segregated cities in the United States, you'll see that it's completely dominated by cities with military bases, mm. <coughs> where there's a constant uh, changeover of people from the military. Mm. No, and to, and they're, they're more integrated. I only saw that uh, <laughs> Minneapolis had slipped off the list, so I thought we were, yeah. we were losing ground. <laughs> um, how do you determine the format? Uh, you have uh, the book divided into different classifications like sports, mm -hmm. arts, people, animals. Mm -hmm. um, how, uh, how do you fit uh, the different categories? How do you determine which ones are the important ones? And uh, We have different uh, types of lists. You know, I mentioned just now the, the annotated lists mm -hmm. where, where each entry has a little story. Then there are statistical ranking lists like the one you just mentioned, the integrated and segregated cities. Then there's uh, what we call uh, celebrity or expert lists in which we write to a famous person or pick a topic and find the expert in that subject and ask them to do a list. So we have in this volume uh, uh, George Burns's Five Tips for Meeting Women. Uh, we have uh, Colin Powell's Advice for Living. And we also have Irma Bombeck's Advice for Living, um, you know, such as uh, uh, never have more children than you have windows in your car, something like that. <laughs> um, uh, whereas Colin Powell's tended to be a, a little bit more serious than that. Uh, and then experts, <coughs> we read about a man who's specialty, his whole life was devoted to recording nature. So we got a list from him on the quietest places in the world, his definition of quiet being free of man-made sound. And it's interesting to note mm -hmm. that in the United States, according to his studies, there is no place in the United States where you can go more than a half hour without hearing a man-made sound, usually an airplane. Really? Yeah. Huh. Half hour is the longest. That was so in Utah. Where was the, uh, the number one place? It was F Fish Springs, Utah. I think it's in the Canyonlands oh. area, which is a really uh -huh. harsh, remote area. And planes don't even want to fly over it. <laughs> um, and so, you know, there, there's this variety of methods that we use and the, the different kinds of lists. And we try to get mm -hmm. a little, you know, the different kinds of lists for each chapter or each subject heading. Uh, what are the reactions of some of the celebrities or well-known people that uh, you contact to do this? Are they generally pretty willing? They're generally pretty willing, um, particularly if we pick the right topic. Mm -hmm. For example, we, we went to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and instead of asking him, who do you think were the ten greatest basketball, basketball players, players of all time, we asked him, uh, who are your favorite uh, jazz musicians? Because we know that that was an interest of his. Um, likewise, we asked Dudley Moore, the comedian, uh, who are your favorite, uh, who do you think are the greatest classical pianists in history? Because that's a subject of great interest to him. Mm -hmm. And so often if we can match a person with uh, something they'd really like to talk about rather than what they're expected to talk about, we get a good response. And uh, uh, the ones we always enjoy the most are where the person has obviously put a lot of thought into it and annotated their own list. For example, we contacted Alan Dershowitz, the uh, controversial lawyer uh, Klaus Van Bulow, Mike Tyson, and so forth. Um, and we asked him, what ten people from history would you like to have defended? Non-living people. So mm -hmm. he put, you know, Galileo, you know, shouldn't have copped a plea. You know, that sort of thing. <laughs> uh -huh. I mean, Jesus Christ, he would have liked to have been up there. Needed uh -huh. a good lawyer. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, we, and, you know, we often write to people we admire, or, you know, people we think would get a good answer give a clever answer. Do uh, any of those folks ever write to you suggesting uh, that they be included in a future one and offering their, uh, their lists? No, no, we haven't. Uh, not for a long, yes, actually they, <laughs> in, after the first book of this came out we had some, some contact, mostly when we'd run into mm. somebody or meet them, you know. Um, hey, what about me? Out in the world, yeah, hey, I've got a list for you, you know. Uh -huh. But uh, no, now it, it's all people that we contacted. What about from general readers? Do they uh, like to suggest their own, uh, oh, yes. their own favorites? And 
Definitely, mm -hmm. and oh, you know, we've we've been very lucky with our readers and giving us good ideas. And uh, <coughs> in the third book of lists, the one that came out in '83. Uh, we actually printed some, what we called everyday lists from people. A lot of the oh. things that at the time might have circulated around the office, you know, 15 reasons why I didn't do my work today, or, you know, the policeman, this, uh, this policeman sent us uh, the weirdest excuses he ever received mm -hmm. from people he, had, you know, was giving a ticket to. Or, uh -huh. And then the one that turned out to be enormously popular with children was. Um, uh, you know, things your parents always say to you that you don't want to hear. <laughs> Every kid had an addition to that list. Uh -huh. It was universal. <laughs> what was the top one? Oh, um, uh, no. <laughs> that was the first thing. Um, why can't point? you be like blank, blank, uh -huh. blank? Um, if you don't do this, I'm going to make you blank, blank, blank. Mm -hmm. I've said them all. <laughs> <laughs> Who, uh, who does your research? Do you have a research staff, or um, uh, maybe you could explain a little bit about how With the workings of the book go, and then also about how you and your sister Amy Wallace do the uh, uh, the co-authorship. Sure. Of it. Um, the book list is different than the People's Almanac in the research sense. Also, I do the mm -hmm. almanac myself. Mm -hmm. uh, the The People's Almanac uh, have a staff, two people full time, and then uh, research staff of, uh, <coughs> well, at the moment, seven or eight part-time people. If anybody out there wants to uh, volunteer uh, or is looking for a part-time job and is clever and sees the right things, our address uh -huh. is in the book. Um, <laughs> the book of lists is, is a m more unusual research challenge. I once gave a series of lectures on creative research. And this is what we, we go through with the book of lists. Our philosophy is that for anything you want to know, there is somebody in the United States who has the answer or is the expert in whatever esoteric field you can possibly imagine. And so r rather than uh, spend a tremendous amount of hours uh, trying to get it out of uh, databases and out of uh, libraries, it's often a matter of figuring out how can we find that person and then finding the person. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, uh, we had one of the stranger lists we had was um, uh, the, the after success careers of rock and roll stars who only had one hit. Oh, I remember reading yes, that. Yes, and <laughs> they're known as one hit wonders, which uh -huh. means that you, you, you had one billboard top 40 and never made the top 100 again. Well, it so happens that there's a fellow named Steve Rosen who uh, <coughs> edits a uh, periodical called One Hit Wonders, and uh, this is an entire magazine devoted to the subject. So we contacted him, and he gave us that list. And, uh, or there's somebody who specializes in TV pilots that were never made. And so we contacted him, and what did he think were the weirdest ones that were never made? <laughs> uh, uh, so I like that kind yeah. of research. I think it's fun. And uh, we did the same thing with our photographs, you know, try to get a really unusual photograph. We have a, a list in there of uh, clubs that are, are very special for only certain uh, uh, people, like the Annette Funicello Fan Club. The Annette Funicello Fan Club, yes. These are organizations that are not for everyone. Diving dentists. <laughs> diving dentists, that's yeah. right. Those are uh, uh, professional so I guess dentists having, who scuba dive. Having uh, yeah. awareness of organizations like that, if you do need to, uh, to go get to, yeah. more additional facts, that yeah. uh, those are probably the experts. Yeah. Yes, you never know uh, what, what controversy you, you were going to run into. For example, uh, I wrote a list on unusual sporting events, such as the uh, annual lawnmower racing championship or the uh, first annual robot sumo contest. Mm -hmm. And I came across an article about a, um, a nonviolent hunting contest for archers, where they, instead of actually shooting animals, they set up fake animals and you shoot, and it's for hunters who you know, don't really want to kill an animal. Mm -hmm. So I innocently called up the local branch of this organization, and he, the man was furious, wouldn't talk to me, and I thought, what is this? And, well, it turned out he'd been threatened by animal rights groups, and he thought I was somebody else pretending to be <laughs> David Wallachinsky. And finally I convinced him that I, I, I really did want to write about his, 
his competition and he referred mm. me to the national organization. <laughs> <laughs> it all worked out. Yeah. What type of person does it take to uh, put together a book like The Book of Bliss or The People's Almanac? Uh, maybe you could describe your attributes that you think help you in, uh, in doing a successful job. Well, one thing I, I learned from my father was uh, an interest in uh, diverse subjects, just to be interested in, in the world and in life, and particularly in those things that are odd and a little bit different mm -hmm. and that don't fit into normal theories or normal reality. Uh, and then, of course, uh, a certain amount of obsession, <laughs> uh, <laughs> wanting to get it exactly right, wanting to get that final entry on the list, and uh, being organized. You've got to be organized. There's no question about it. Um, uh, and looking at things a little differently. When I read the newspaper, uh, yes, I'm reading the, the headline stories and all that, but I'm looking for uh, something a little bit different uh, in, in a story that a normal person might read and, and might look at differently uh, when I read uh, Ho Chi Minh's. In matter of fact, for, for people who want to try out for our research job, this is what we give a quiz to people who want to be researchers for us. And one of the quizzes is we give them an obituary of Ho Chi Minh and ask them circle six, six items you wouldn't normally, in this obituary that you wouldn't normally find in, in, in a, an article about, in a biography of Ho Chi Minh. For example, that he had been a uh, pastry, pastry chef who had been trained by Escoffier and uh, that he had once uh, worked in Harlem, things like that. So uh, it's that <laughs> little sidelight we look for. It's <laughs> yeah. interesting. Um, in putting the book together, especially the latest book, uh, what are some of the things you left out? What didn't uh, make it to the final uh, edit? Uh, you mentioned. Uh, Oddly enough, you, you, you mentioned the um, organizations that are not for everyone. And in the original uh, first draft of the uh, book, we had a couple organizations that had unfortunately gone out of business in, in the last <laughs> Those few are months. somewhat volatile. Yeah, yeah. For example, mm. one, one I liked was the Slow Food Foundation. This is to counteract the uh, fast foods. Mm. These are slow foods that you should sit and enjoy your meal. And, but I, I think they were just so slow that they couldn't keep up their membership organization. I don't know what went wrong. Um, <laughs> there are certain uh, topics that we keep ongoing files and just didn't quite have enough entries yet to, to include it in the book and hopefully somewhere down the line we can use it again. Mm -hmm. For example, I wanted to do, uh, I, I've been keeping a file on um, two murder lists. One is, uh, murderers who used unusual weapons. I think the most famous in recent history is the uh, Gregory Markov murder in which the Bulgarian uh, secret police killed Markov by uh, um, coming up behind him and poking him with, uh, with an umbrella that had poison on the tip. Or there was another case in early in this century in which a Hungarian man uh, uh, in a fit of jealousy uh, killed his uh, his lover who had just rejected him by uh, pouring radium, consistently pouring radium on her typewriter keys until she had absorbed so much that she died. <laughs> um, so, but I just, just didn't have enough to, to have mm -hmm. a full list, so I'm waiting on that one. And the other murder list is um, stupid murderers or stupid attempted murderers mm -hmm. uh, who made ridiculous uh, attempts. Um, there's an ongoing file that, that I collect and which is in the new book of lists of stupid thieves. Mm -hmm. And it's been very easy to find stupid thieves, but uh, stupid murderers are, are a bit harder. But I'll get them. <laughs> um, everybody, I suppose, has their favorites. I, uh, I like Dr. Domeno's uh, <laughs> worst song title list, uh, especially the uh, I'd rather have a bottle in front of me than a frontal lobotomy. Right, right. But, uh, <laughs> what are some of your favorites, and what have, over the years, have been some of the readers' favorites? Well, I, I also like <laughs> Dr. Domeno. Dr. is one of my favorites. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, uh, in fact, I have one that he didn't, uh, since he didn't put it in, in his list, I'll, I'll put it in mine. Exclusive which was, for the show here. Yeah, yes. Is, uh, I heard it on the radio once while I was driving through Georgia, yeah, or Florida, actually. It was, uh, my pride's not hard to swallow if I chew it long enough. <laughs> Love that one. In the Ballad of Jeffrey Dahmer, I heard that recently. Um, uh, the most requested list we ever had, and we ran it in the book of list three, so we didn't run it again, because nothing's repeated. Um, we had so many letters asking us to print Kennedy-Lincoln 
coincidences. You know, Kennedy had a secretary right. named Lincoln. Lincoln had a secretary mm -hmm. named Kennedy. Certain Ford Theater, Ford Car. Characters in the that's, name. That's right. Like that. yeah, exactly. So we finally, we did run that one. That yeah. was popular. I like the ones that are hard to do, uh, that you can't look up in the library, that you just have to wait over the years collecting one item at a time until you've, you've got enough to make a list. Such and, as? Well, such as unusual lawsuits, which is another one of my mm -hmm. favorite topics. Um, uh, to give an example, uh, we have what we call the, uh, the Romeo and Juliet of the soft drink industry, uh, where this uh, woman worked for Coca-Cola. And Coca-Cola uh, learned that she had become engaged to marry an employee of Pepsi. Sounds so stupid, but it's true. <laughs> and so they told her that she would either have to break off her engagement with him or she would be fired. And uh, so she, she sued, eventually sued Coca-Cola and won the case. And uh, she stopped working. And he still works for Pepsi. And we have a <coughs> lovely wedding picture of the Blakes in the, in the book of lists. <laughs> and what uh, did they serve at the reception? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't Coca-Cola, I'll tell you that. <laughs> You travel around a lot. Um, what's, what's the reaction to the Book of Lists and People's Almanacs in other country? And is there that same uh, interest in Significa uh, around the world? Oh, there is. I, it, it's incredible how many countries the Book of Lists has reached. Mm -hmm. I, I have received fan, fan letters, reader mail, from Bhutan. Um, I once came across the book. I like to travel to unusual places. And I, I went to Yap, you know, the, the place <laughs> with the big stone money. And they have a very traditional culture there. And they, they had one grocery store. And I went in, <laughs> and there was there the was. Book of Lists being sold in <laughs> Yap. Uh, so uh, it seems very popular in um, India, they're, they're, where there are voracious readers in mm -hmm. India, the, the educated population there. Uh, and we've, we've just had letters from all over it. Um, uh, we recently got a letter. It took a while, but we got a letter from Cuba. Um, I, you know, how it got there, I don't know, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, somehow the, the, the book had made it there, all over mm -hmm. Africa. Yeah, it's been really, really gratifying. The book of lists has been translated into 14 languages. Um, but often it's just, it's really the English language version that gets around. Mm -hmm. We'd get letters from, um, uh, <coughs> uh, during the Persian Gulf War, we got letters from soldiers there, peacekeeping forces all over the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Now, you are probably working at this moment on uh, the new People's Almanac that's coming out in 1995? Yes, the People's Almanac of the 20th uh -huh. century. Uh, working hard on that. Uh -huh. It takes a lot of time and a lot of energy. I bet. And uh, I have another book, which uh, is an ongoing project for me, the, uh, which is called The Complete Book of the Olympics, which is a combination record book and, and stories, all the best anecdotes of the Olympics. And so that will be out in... Uh, in 93, uh, I'll have the complete book of the Winter Olympics, uh -huh. and then in 96, the complete book of the Summer Olympics, because now the Olympics are two years apart. Okay. And the Book of Lists, the 90s edition, is available now. And uh, the time flew by. I wish we could uh, sit and talk about some more of the, our favorite categories, but it's really been a pleasure uh, uh, talk with you and uh, uh, invite all the readers to okay. be sure and look for the new Book of Lists, the 90s edition. and. Uh, I uh, thank David Wolachewski for being our guest today on the discussion with. Thank you. Presentation of the Hennepin County Library.